At altitudes of over 8,000 meters, the Earth is so thin that it forms inaccessible bubbles around the highest summits on Earth. Fields of rock and snow at the outer limits of the stratosphere are protected from human intrusion by an invisible barrier. The barrier is known as hypoxia. Hypoxia literally means the absence of oxygen, and it acts like an insidious poison that suffocates not only the lungs and muscles, but also the brain. Working 20 years apart from one another, two scientific pioneers, Nicholas Jaeger and Emmanuel Kochi, decided to take a closer look at this phenomenon. When I reached the southern peak of Everest, I took one step, and then I spent a minute or two trying to catch my breath. Finding that I couldn't catch my breath, I decided to forge ahead since the goal was to reach the summit anyway. But I was never able to regain my breath. Up there, it feels like you're breathing with a plastic bag over your head. The feeling that there is little oxygen and that you have to save your breath as much as possible, and that time is limited. The feeling can be very scary. In 1990, Dr. Emmanuel Cauchy abandoned his attempt to reach the summit of Everest in order to save his life. Since then, he has investigated the domain of high altitude, taking a medical approach. During his investigations, he came across Nicholas Jaeger, a pioneer of hypoxia in low oxygen environments. I discovered Nicholas Jaeger when I was very young. I read his book when I was 14. And I realized just how much this person fascinated me. He shared my interest in physical activities a sort of balance between physical exertion and intellectual curiosity. And I just really enjoy practicing alpine medicine for that reason. I also enjoy the eccentric, well, kind of crazy and adventurous side of it, and the chance to do something that's never been done before. Nicholas Jaeger, like Emmanuel Cauchy, was a doctor. Fascinated by hypoxia, he put himself to the test in order to solve its enigmas. In 1979, he climbed to the top of the Andes in Peru. He lived at 6,700 meters longer than anybody in history, undergoing medical exercises each day despite the cold and discomfort. The idea for this experiment occurred to him the year before at the top of Mount Everest. It was an unusually beautiful day on Everest. Burdened by the weight of their oxygen bottles, three Frenchmen made it to the top of the world, 25 years after Tenzing and Hillary's historic feat. Once at the top, Nicholas Jaeger and his companions took off their masks. 8,848 meters high. The top of Mount Everest is the closest a man can get to the stratosphere. The air is three times thinner than at sea level. In other words, the body functions on three times less oxygen than normal. Until the spring of 1978, nobody in the world had ever breathed air like that without an oxygen bottle. Experts had said it was impossible. For one and a half hours, Nicholas Jaeger took photos and chatted with his companions, observing them with a doctor's eye. It was interesting from a medical point of view. I am surprised that one feels as well as one does at that altitude. We are all without masks. The second you move, you are completely breathless. But none of us has a headache. We are very comfortable. We are lucky to have such exceptional weather. 
It's not cold. The sun is warm. There is a slight wind from the north, but we are two meters below the ridge and we hardly feel it. While his companions were getting ready to descend, Jaeger, all alone, lit a filterless gitan, the highest cigarette in the world. It's no big deal for him, but it's an important indicator. If he is able to inhale smoke in such an oxygen-poor atmosphere, it's because he has a unique ability to withstand hypoxia. That day, his horizons changed. He decided he would return to Everest. Not like the French expedition so contrary to his style. No, this time he would go it alone, without oxygen bottles and by the most arduous path. The gigantic south wall of Lhotse. To face such a challenge, Jaeger had to prepare his body for the lack of oxygen and become a kind of explorer of hypoxia. He would spend the last 18 months of his life working on the project. Nicholas Jaeger had been climbing ever since he could walk, and he lived out his passion with a kind of dauntless gravity. He first made his name as an alpinist when he was still a medical student. He is self-confident, quick, and solitary. When he obtained his diploma as a guide in 1975, he graduated at the top of his class at the National School of Ski and Alpinism. At 32, this doctor who had just embarked upon his career was simply one of the best alpinists of his generation. He discovered high-altitude alpinism in Peru, 5,000 meters, 6,000 meters. He immediately felt at ease at low oxygen levels. Nicolas Jaeger returned to the Cordillera Blanca in the beginning of the summer of 1979. But this time, the sprinter had to learn to slow down. He wanted to take the time to explore his body to know just how far he could go in resisting hypoxia. His goal was to live for several months on the highest summit in Peru, Huascaran, which overlooks the town of Huaraz. Operation Survive Alone on Huascaran, alone at 6,700 meters on the highest summit in the Andes of Peru. Alone for several months, Nicholas Jaeger set up camp in the land of low oxygen where the air has only 43% of normal oxygen levels. At once, both doctor and guinea pig, he was deliberately exposing himself to conditions that disrupt the body. In the midst of the Cordillera Blanca, his tiny blue vessel looked as if it was floating on a sea of petrified waves. A dauntless traveler, Nicholas Jaeger, was setting out for the physiological unknown. How would his body react? For the doctor, as for the alpinist, the answer was rife with unknowns and surprises. More than anything else, the mountain is something sensitive. It has a keen understanding of itself. I understood along with it that when you undergo something, an acclimatization, you feel stronger and you're able to anticipate medical problems. <laughs> How do you acclimatize? For most mortals, you have to push open the door on the world of low oxygen. Take the first right when you arrive at Chamonix. Take the cable car to the Aiguille du Midi, nearly 3,000 meters all in one go. And just like that, in half an hour, you find yourself plunged into air that has a third less oxygen than normal. 
C'est toujours impressionnant. Francine and Virginie are nurses who work at the Chamonix Hospital with Dr. Cushy. Every day they're dealing with mountain sickness in their work and have agreed to climb to high altitudes and describe the experience. I'm totally out of breath. I didn't think that at 3,800 meters I'd be so out of breath. I'm having trouble getting air. My legs are weak. Do you feel your legs getting wobbly? Don't worry, we'll take it slowly. You need to start thinking about your breathing. It's very important. If you feel out of breath, I'll adapt to your rhythm. That's why I'm here. Try a short, regular rhythm, especially if you feel like you're getting a headache. Well, you see, we left at 1,000 meters and climbed very quickly to 3,800. And you're not at all acclimated, so it's absolutely normal. Once you enter an oxygen-poor atmosphere, the body sets into motion a sort of emergency plan. Breathing accelerates and the heart beats faster. But this protective reflex is not efficient and is costly in terms of energy. The body wastes its resources like an engine that is being revved up. In order to understand the mechanism, you have to look deep inside the body. Oxygen, the body's fuel, descends to the bottom of the bronchioles. It crosses the membranes of the alveoli and enters the blood. Red blood cells transport it to the heart, where the blood is pumped through the aorta and the arteries to the organs and muscles. When oxygen is lacking, the mechanism stalls. High altitudes produce a shock to the body. The first night is often accompanied by unpleasant symptoms. Migraine, nausea, loss of appetite, insomnia and vomiting. Francine knows that the acclimatization process starts the second she gets out of the cable car and that the effects will be unpleasant. Manu. 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 Francine isn't feeling well. What time is it? Two o'clock. Well, we can try and put you in a pressurization bag for a while. And that should help. I can't breathe out. I, I vomited everything I, I, and I have nothing left. You have to go slow when you pump, or else you'll get sick. Ouais. 
Are you okay, Francine? Originally, this was done to treat pulmonary edema. We used it only in emergency situations. Little by little, we realized we could also use it to treat acute mountain sickness when people were having difficulty acclimatizing. We can do one or two sessions while on expedition or while trekking. It works well. We do short treatments with it before major problems occur. We begin by increasing the pressure. In other words, it's like descending going down very quickly. Here we have a conversion table. We're at about 3,500 meters here. And when the bag is inflated, we'll be at the equivalent of 1,200. You've descended Chamonix by cable car. Afterwards, five pumps every minute to replenish the oxygen, or else you'll go blue. And tomorrow you won't be having lunch with us. To adapt to hypoxia, Francine's body has begun a painful transformation. One hour in the bag will make these symptoms disappear by simulating a super speedy descent. But this magical effect is only temporary. The mechanism has been activated and the body is beginning to produce more red blood cells. This upheaval is quite painful. Inside the alveoli, the blood soon will be able to absorb a lot more oxygen. After two weeks, the body will find a new equilibrium. Our vital organs will breathe better. These symptoms are linked to acclimatization, above all, the initial shock to the body with the drop in oxygen pressure. The body responds violently at first with simple, primitive reactions, hyperventilation, increased heart rate, and that results in a number of repercussions, modifications, and therefore problems. The fragile structure of acclimatization can collapse even in the most experienced alpinists. This Sherpa being transported half unconscious by his companions is a victim of hypoxia. He is suffering from a cerebral edema and won't survive another day at this altitude. Alpinists have been climbing the Himalayas for a century. But until the 1960s, doctors were unaware of what happens to the body at these altitudes. A number of fatalities remained unexplained. Today, hypoxia is better understood. We know that edema is an acute and often fatal form of mountain sickness. That doesn't stop alpinists from carrying on exploring high altitudes at the risk of their lives. Hypoxia disrupts the body's metabolism even at the microscopic level. Our cells suffer. Sometimes the cells of the blood vessels start to leak. Plasma begins to flood the interior of the brain inside the cranium. This causes cerebral edema. If nothing is done at the first signs of trouble, death can occur within 24 hours. Yet descending is a miracle treatment. The sick Sherpa is evacuated by helicopter and survives. To Nicholas Jaeger, high altitude was second nature. His expression remained impassive, showing no signs of discomfort. The 300 kilos of supplies required for survival alone during several months were carefully arranged in front of the tent. Inside, everything was incredibly well organized. Jaeger had foreseen every detail needed to record his experiment. As soon as he could, he set up his camera in order to film his daily routine. The doctor, guinea pig, was adjusting well. Once a week, despite the cold, he undressed for an electrocardiogram. 
Each day, he performed tests on his respiration and recorded various details in his notebook for his medical thesis. His weight, food, observations on sleep and morale. He had brought medicine with him, but had sworn not to take any unless in an emergency. He kept his word. Weeks passed slowly at the top of Huascaran. Nicholas Jaeger was so well acclimatized that his survival experiment was beginning to look like a camping excursion on a white, sandy beach. As soon as the weather allowed, he climbed to the top of Huascaran to enjoy the magnificent view. Some people are surprised to see me smoke as a doctor and as an alpinist. I simply reply, nobody's perfect. His acclimatization was now complete. His forgetting to stop smoking was merely a sign that everything was back to normal. His first medical checkup was very reassuring. I came here to study the debilitating effects of high altitude, and nothing has happened. I sleep like a baby. I haven't lost weight, I eat well, and yesterday I worked with the shovel for four hours without any particular difficulty. I think it must be due to the fact that I have spent a lot of time at high altitudes for the last three consecutive years. I think my body has developed a special type of super acclimatation. Dr. Jaeger believed that he had overcome hypoxia. But his experiment had a weakness. He was the only subject in his study and couldn't observe himself objectively. Those who followed in his footsteps would be obliged to correct that flaw. Jaeger showed us that a doctor can be his own guinea pig. He can be an alpinist and at the same time experiment with his own body. It's the association of being a doctor and an alpinist studying how the body works that is interesting. And that's the legacy he has left us. That's how I found myself inside a COMEX decompression chamber, which was designed for deep sea divers. In 1997, after several high-altitude experiments, doctors following in the footsteps of Nicholas Jaeger designed an experiment to study hypoxia in the lab. Five weeks were spent in a decompression chamber in order to progressively acclimatize to the virtual altitude of Everest and to remain there for one whole week, crowded like sardines in a can under the all-watchful eye of Professor Jean-Paul Richelet. Like Jaeger in Peru, Emmanuel Cushy mans the camera himself to record the experiment. He films himself daily, his face at times swollen with cutaneous edema. Well, today at 6,000 meters, it's a bit tough taking it gradually. We've already experienced the first signs of trouble, some slight irritation marks, which I believe are going to get worse. But I guess that's normal and you just have to deal with it. Well, the first day is always hard because you have to acclimatize, but it gets better with each following day. I'm tingling all over, I don't feel very well. Not much energy. Does your head hurt? Yes, I have a headache. 
Is it like the ophthalmic migraines you used to get? In terms of the pain, yes, I have pain behind my eyes, but it's okay. It's kind of an interesting feeling. I took some pills that I've just vomited up, so I still have a headache, but it's all right. It's really quite an adventure. Now go on, breathe. It's not always easy. After 40 days, the weather on Huascaran changed. A storm lashed the small tent relentlessly. I would have liked to have made this recording outside, but it's really too cold. I have lost about two kilos since the beginning of the experiment, which is normal. I've done quite a bit of work with the medical examinations. Things, of course, are starting to get tougher. In front of the camera, the guinea pig looked fine. But in his green notebook, he began to note some troubling symptoms. A painful awakening in the night, breathlessness, brief but painful, the feeling of a block too preventing me from filling my lungs. There was a bit of anxiety before going to sleep last night. I feared a repetition of the fit of breathlessness from the previous night. I feel noticeably more tired despite the relatively low amount of activity. For the second time, I observed a drop in blood pressure, which must account for the fatigue. Ready, go. Inside the decompression chamber, the eight guinea pigs have surpassed the altitude of Huascaran. Watch these images carefully. It's not cold, there is no wind. We're on the top of a virtual mountain. The discomfort we see on their faces is due solely to hypoxia. Uh-oh, the 7,000 mark is tough. We're all having trouble breathing. Well, the second you have a chance, you take a nap. We're on the third day now. That's still not it. Still not it. You have to be self-reliant in the hydrosphere. The monitors can no longer come in. When there's too big a difference in pressure, that creates bubbles. Bubbles in the heart. It's a little nerve-wracking. Hypoxia deregulates the body as if each cell was suffocating and can no longer carry out its functions. The blood vessels that line the alveoli become leaky. That's pulmonary edema. The lungs fill with fluid and you drown internally in less than 24 hours. Are you okay, Jeff? Uh, so so. We all feel like throwing up. Yeah, a needle here, a needle there. A sample at 8,000 meters is sudden death. But today it's vasovagal syncope after vasovagal syncope. Afonco. 
<laughs> oh, totally. A fond complet. Il a fait moi un poumon. Give me another lung. It's like being on another planet. My head is tingling. Very strange feelings. Bizarre. The real Everest, the summit, you don't stay there too long. You stay an hour at most and then you have to start back down. Very bizarre sensations. I feel like I'm shot up with oxygen in the head. It's almost boiling. Implacable, Nicholas Jaeger followed his routine perched on the summit of the Cordillera in the Andes. He had broken the record for high altitude endurance and never missed a chance to communicate that all was well. Two kilometers higher than the summit of Mont Blanc, the experiment continued. After weeks of storms during which he remained stuck in his tent, he went out at the first sign of good weather as if nothing had happened. The battery in his radio was dead. There was nothing left to read. There was only the monotony of the daily routine, melt snow, write, smoke. Stoic, after a month and a half at high altitude, the man of iron kept writing. Nothing would prevent him from earning his certification for one of the most audacious Himalayan adventures. Look what I just did. I was so out of it. I wanted to say, I can't talk, and I couldn't write it. Show me. I couldn't finish it. There, try to write again. See if there's a change. In the decompression chamber, at 8,000 meters, the alternauts are no longer able to acclimatize. The body has reached the limits of its resistance to the absence of oxygen and bizarre things start to happen. I understand it, but you won't understand a thing. Show me. Is that your normal handwriting? Not at all. I'm trying to read it. I can't speak. But if you concentrate, can you write any better than that? No, no, I'm out of it. I'm angry. No, I can't do it. Yeah, you're having a problem. You need a little shot of oxygen. Above 8,000 meters, acclimatization is no longer possible. The blood has become richer in red blood cells, what's called hypererythrocytosis, and it's a double-edged sword. The advantage is that the body uses to its maximum ability what little oxygen there is, and the disadvantage is that the blood becomes thicker and more viscous so that it circulates poorly.
On the summit of Huascaran, Dr. Jager was suffering above all from boredom. On the 15th of August, he thought of the French vacation as stuck in traffic jams. He had not spoken to anyone for a month and a half. His wife and two daughters were getting ready to go back to school 10,000 kilometers away. He claimed he was happy, but a moment of apprehension came with the arrival of each night. Alone, high up in the atmosphere, he wrote a book entitled Journal of Solitude. Between two stormy spells, Jager forced himself to exercise. He carried out his tests and climbed to the summit of Huascaran to ski. But his heart wasn't in it anymore. Fifty-five days had passed. Two months, two meters of snow. The ice of Huascaran had almost encased the little blue vessel. When the doctor addressed the camera one last time, the lassitude on his face belied his confident tone. Medically speaking, there is nothing new. My condition is absolutely stable. My weight hasn't changed, I sleep well, and so I don't think there is any reason to prolong the stay, since all evidence indicates that physically I could stay up here for a long time. After two continuous months on Huascaran, Nicholas Jaeger was thinking about other summits, and of course, of Mount Everest. In May 1978, five months before his ascent, Reinhold Messner and Peter Habler were the first men to reach the top of the world without oxygen bottles. On their faces, we can see the strain of their effort at the edge of asphyxia. But there's also a triumphant smile. Up to the last minute, medical experts predicted they would not return alive. Nicholas Jaeger also dreamed of a similar triumph that pushes back the limits of what is possible. As he descended Huascaran after two solitary months at 6,700 meters, Nicholas Jaeger felt the satisfaction of a job well done. He felt his body had resisted the ordeal and that he had attained a state of super acclimatization. Yet one detail escaped him. His muscles had weakened. Before the end of his descent, he collapsed, the victim of an extreme form of fatigue that he was unable to explain. The incident is even more troubling in that he had forgotten it when he wrote his thesis. However, this loss of memory and lucidity is precisely an effect of hypoxia. Weakened by two months without enough oxygen, the pioneering doctor could no longer see the trap that was waiting for him. Being in high altitude for a long time, we know that the first areas of the brain to be affected are the most delicate. We know that self-awareness and ability to judge are suppressed. Memory and all of the brain's more subtle functions are the first to be affected. We have to get Philip out, he's not doing well. Does he have oxygen? Yes, he has oxygen, but we've got to get him out. It happens quickly. You can pass out very quickly. Watch him closely, give him air. Don't leave him alone. Are you going to be okay? What's my name? 
Fifi, comment Philip, vous appelez Philip, what's my name Enfin, et, et là Guillaume. Oui. Guillaume, bon. Après, comment Après, vas-y. Guillaume. Et puis T'as mal à la tête Do you have a headache But I don't know his name anymore. You understand now why some people die. When the guy drops his backpack and then jumps into the void, that's cerebral anoxia. There's no more oxygen in the brain, that's all. The subtlest functions don't work anymore. The cortex stops working and you stop recognizing people. Am I having an edema? No, it's not a cerebral edema, it's anoxia. Your brain doesn't have enough oxygen. Can you imagine if that happens to you at the top of Everest and you have to go down by foot? You die. What are you doing? You don't know. You just sit there. You run around. And if you want to throw yourself down a crevasse, there are certainly many people who have died that way. We say they fell into a crevasse, but that's not so. They went mad. went mad. At 8,000 meters, the weakened brain can give up on us without warning. That's the most dangerous trap created by hypoxia. Altinauts understand it very well. They are reaping the fruits of 20 years of research and five weeks of intensive experimentation in a decompression chamber. But Nicholas Jaeger could not have foreseen the trap. A few months after returning from Huascaran, he was at the foot of Lhotse feeling very confident. His great ambition was before him. He wanted to climb the immense south face and continue on to Everest. And Kipling Kim, uh, when he arrives in view of the Himalayas, he said, it's no world for men. And that's obvious, it's no world for men. <laughs> in Kathmandu, Nicholas Jaeger was talking to Bill Rosser, an American filmmaker, here to film snow leopards. Fascinated by the Dr. Alpinist, Rosser met him the day before his attempt on the summit and filmed this extraordinary interview. Jager replied in English without dodging the important questions. He appeared ambitious and calm and very aware of the risks, yet confident in having overcome hypoxia. After 10 years climbing in the Alps, and in, mostly in the Alps and in the Andes, uh, I want to go higher, longer, more difficult, and uh, I'm trying to use uh, what I've been learning, yes. <laughs> I try to do my work the best I can. I don't uh, uh, say work as a, something unpleasant, but as something pleasant, it's a good part of the pleasure when you succeed and when you reach the top. It was exactly the same idea when I was at the top of Everest. Well, I finished my work, I completed my work that was properly done, and that's very pleasant feeling. I spent uh, five months in Paris. I was very happy to be with my family and to meet friends and to drink wine because I'm from Burgundy, so I do like wine. But after five months, I need something else. His father would bring him to Fontainebleau every Saturday to rock. Line. He was already in his element at Fontainebleau. He was tireless and not afraid. He was a solitary child. He had few friends and loved solitude. Nicholas passed his vacations in the family home, and there, with his grandfather, he read Tintin. And I have to say that the grandfather was as interested as the grandson. They both knew whole passages and chapters by heart. His grandfather was also adventurous. He built some of the first airplanes and owned one of the first airplane factories for wooden planes. They naturally got along very well together and they talked as one adventurer to another. Future adventurer, that is. He was thrilled when he was sick because we left him alone, and he could travel to every country, go on any kind of imaginary expedition that he wanted.
He wasn't gentle. Perhaps because he took after his mother. He had a fairly good relationship. He didn't talk much. He was a very private person. That made it a bit difficult. Well, <laughs> I talk a lot, so it was hard for him to get a word in edgewise. We did all right. At times, he was a bit grumpy. And we interpreted that as pretentiousness, but it was more like perfectionism. He wanted to get the most he could out of everyone. He made it hard for himself, and he was very harsh with himself. But he was also that way with others. The challenge now, the, the real challenge, is to climb quickly with light teams and with as little equipment as possible. I have to be back in 10 days. Uh, afterwards, well, I can survive several days, but mm, nothing much. And I have to be back, let's say. It can't be over two weeks. At any time, will it be possible for you to receive assistance from no. the outside at all? <laughs> no, I don't really uh, count on that. And uh, I'm uh, above 7,000 meters. I really can't see <laughs> who could. Uh, I go and search. And, you know, the mountain is so big, you have to be, uh, I think, well, deeply prepared. And I've been living here for one month at the foot of Lotse, and, well, I'm beginning to get used to it, and uh, I'm ready to go and happy to go. If you are properly prepared, you don't feel afraid, then you feel concentrated. You have, let's say, a wall to uh, jump over, and while well, you do your best to do it, that's not exactly fear, it's very different. The end of the afternoon on the second day of the climb. Nicholas Jaeger set up his tent. Several thousand meters below, Bill Rosser, through his telescope, watched him dig a hole in the snow and settle in for a long night. The next day, the filmmaker followed a tiny spot on the icy slopes, which were getting steeper and steeper, until a veil of mist soon covered it completely. When you have been for many years in the mountains, you could forget completely uh, that it's dangerous. And I have to Keep in mind, every day, it's no world for men. Because if you forget that, it's like when boxing, and if you lower your hands while you're finished, then it's very simple. And it's very quick. Nicholas Jaeger was officially declared missing on the 23rd of May, 1980. We will never know if it was hypoxia that killed the pioneer, what is certain is that he helped doctors establish the degree to which very high altitudes are deadly, where man cannot survive for more than a dozen hours without the aid of oxygen bottles. Today, countless alpinists follow in his footsteps, which stop at 8,000 meters at the border of the world of mankind. Some will disappear, 
and their only epitaph will be the following verse that Baudelaire addresses to Icarus. I look in vain for beginning and end of the heaven's slow revolve. Under an unknown eye of fire, I ascend, feeling my wings dissolve. And scorched by desire for the beautiful, I will not know the bliss of giving my name to the abyss that knows my tomb and funeral.